At times I've been asked, how do pastors pick what they preach on? You just open the Bible on Saturday, see where it flops open and go for it. Or uh, throw a dart at a list of books of the Bible. Not really. Uh, there is a tool that many people, many pastors use to help uh, pick what they're going to preach on. It's called a lectionary. It's this three-year cycle uh, of a psalm, Old Testament, New Testament, and gospel reading for every Sunday of the year. And so you could get it out and figure, if you wanted to know what people are going to preach on the Sunday after Easter in the year 2021, I could tell you what that is. It, it would take me a couple minutes, but we could figure it out. Because of uh, this common uh, way of, of picking scriptures, I, I, I confess I don't use it, but I know Rolf does, and Jan, you use it, don't you? It's pretty common to use. Um, because of this common way of choosing scriptures to preach from, there are certain passages that always turn up at the same time of year. Some of them are expected. At Easter, you expect to hear about, hear about resurrection. At uh, Christmas, you expect to hear about a child being born, stuff like that. There is a certain passage, the passage we've read today, this is a passage that always shows up the Sunday after Easter. You hear about Jesus being resurrected, yippee! And then the next Sunday is Doubting Thomas. Every year, Doubting Thomas. A friend of mine is an associate pastor at a rather large church, uh, is in Virginia, and her senior pastor always went on vacation the Sunday after Easter. And so she preached on Doubting Thomas every year the Sunday after Easter for four years running and she is tired of Tom. She doesn't want anything to do with him. She's, she's fried with him. That's it. Um, and, and it tends to be a Sunday you're, you're preaching to a small crowd anyway. Some people call it Cannonball Sunday because you could shoot a cannonball into the pews and not hit anyone. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, it, it's, there's a, there is a stereotypical Doubting Thomas sermon. The short version goes like this. The disciples believed Thomas didn't. Don't be like Thomas. That, that's the Doubting Thomas Sermon, your stock Thomas Sermon. And uh, I, I've got to the, I, I listen to other people's sermons and I read them, and I've got to the point where if I, if I feel a sermon going that direction, I have a hard time finishing it, because, I mean, that's just about as hackneyed as it gets. And so, and the shame of this is that I believe the Word of God is far more interesting and nuanced and deep and complex than saying, you know, that's just how you preach about, about Thomas. I think that's a cop-out. I think there are so many more interesting and fun ways to preach every passage of the Bible. I, I, I'm pretty committed to the idea that if you're reading the Bible and you're finding it boring, is it a problem with you or is it a problem with the Bible? I mean, that, that, that's okay, Leviticus, Leviticus does get dry. But still, the point is, the Bible is the Word of God, and there's a lot going on there. And if you pay attention to it, there's, there's a lot happening. A friend of mine called and said, you know, Andy, i got to preach on Doubting Thomas again. And I don't want to do... Andy, we need to talk about this. And he said, let, let, let's re read it and call me in a little bit, and we'll talk about this and see if there's something that, that jumps out at you. We'll see what happens. And so I read this, this story of Thomas, and he read it too. And, and as I was reading it, a light bulb went off. And I thought, ah, that, that's interesting. And the light bulb went off for him too. And there were different light bulbs. So that's why we get two sermons on, on the exact same passage. Because I just want to show you this. I mean, it, it's one thing to say that there is always more to read when you read the Bible. You're never done with it. It's not like a library book. You chuck it out, you're done with it. Can you imagine going back to a library and giving them back the Bible? I'm done. I've read the Bible. That's it. Next book. I mean, it's not like that. And to show you that we can, this is a second uh, sermon on Thomas, and it has nothing to do with what we talked about last week. Last week was all about Thomas and how, for him, it's not seeing as believing, it's, it's touching as believing. He doesn't care what you can see. Thomas wants to put his hands on it and touch it, and that's how he comes to faith. This week, I want to look at some, a completely different aspect of, of this story. I want to look at this one moment. As far as I can tell, there is one moment when all of scriptures, when Jesus speaks directly to us. We who are sitting here thousands of years later, 2,000 years later. Most of the time when we read scripture, we're overhearing a conversation like between Paul and the church at Galatia or between Paul and the church at Corinth or between uh, when the Gospel of Mark, Mark when he writes for his, the people, he's writing for a church, a congregation. And, and so most of the time we're overhearing a conversation between two people and we're kind of hearing in. It, it's, you remember those party line phones where you could listen in on, on th that? That's... You can't really do that today, but it's kind of like that. We're listening in on someone else's conversation. But in this 
that th in this passage right here, we have this moment where Jesus addresses us right here today. And so we're going to take a look at that. First, we need to look at Thomas and his doubts, though. Thomas is doubting. Can you blame him for doubting Jesus is dead, crucified, gone, or buried? Pfft, dead. And then all the disciples, they're gathered in this room, and they're scared because their leader has been crucified as a threat to the Roman Empire. And, and they're kind of scared they might get killed too, understandably. And so someone's got to go out and get the food, though. So Thomas, he's a... Uh, I identify with Thomas. He's the one who says, Let, let's go to Jerusalem. Even if we have to die, at least we're going to be doing something when they're on their way to Jerusalem. I, Thomas doesn't let problems sit. He wants to do something. And so he gets up, and he's gone. He's going out getting groceries. You've got to eat, even if you're scared. And uh, he is out figuring out what the crowd is saying, figuring out how they're going to get out of town. He's, he's out doing things. And so when he comes back, and the other disciples say, we saw Jesus, his response is, hmm, hmm? And uh, not a surprise. I got to confess, that's what I would have done too. If you said, you know, I saw Jesus. Hmm, are, you, are you sure? Um, and, and, you know, we live in a time when doubt comes naturally. Our culture doubts. If, if some of us are given the, the gift of great faith. That's not me. I, I identify far more with the guy who says to Jesus, I believe, help me with my unbelief. We, we live in a time when we, if, if we are looking around, there are questions. What about people of other religions? People of other faiths? How do we understand God to be good in a world that is so broken? Uh, what, what about, how does science and religion interact? How, these, are, these are questions that if you take them seriously, they will cause you to question and to doubt and to work through things and... Uh, we live in a time when that is common. And so there are many Thomases around people who are doubting. And so what Jesus says to Thomas, Thomas comes back and, and er, Jesus comes to Thomas. Thomas touches Jesus, comes to faith through that. And then Jesus says this about doubt and about faith. And this is what he says to, to us. He says, Thomas, you believe because you have seen. But blessed are you who believe without having seen. That was Jesus talking to us, right? Blessed are those, y'all, who believe without having seen. Interesting word Jesus chooses there, right? Jesus says, y'all are blessed. He doesn't say better. He doesn't say worse. He just says, the word he uses there is blessed. Y'all are blessed because you believe without having seen. Now that word, blessing, blessed... That's a fun word, isn't it? We toss it around all the time, but what does it mean? When you call something blessed, do you know exactly what you're saying? What, is, what does it mean to call something a blessing? Call something blessed. It, it's, it's a word that... Uh, we have this sense that it, it has to be more than just saying something is good. There's a sense that it is a, a distinctly Christian word. It's a word of faith. But what, what does it mean? I found the answer to this question. I have not known. I, if you'd asked me a year ago what a blessing was exactly, I would have squirmed and said, I'm not sure. I found the answer recently, and it is in a kind of unexpected place. Every morning, and by every morning, it probably means like four times a week, but I'm, I'm going to get there every morning. I get up, and I go downstairs, and I spend some time with my Bible and some books and, and, and some of the prayers of the saints. In the same way that we learn to be a dad by watching our dad, I, I learn to pray by, by watching and praying with others who have the saints who have been long gone. And, and I was attending to the words of this German theologian and, and I, w I, I rewrite them and just kind of contemplate them and let them form how I pray, how I think. And, and I came across these words about blessing. And, and this is what he says. Blessing means laying hands, laying one's hands on something and saying, despite everything, you belong to God. This is what we do with the world. We do not abandon it, despise it, or condemn it. Instead, we call it back to God. We give it hope. We lay our hands on it and say, May God renew you, world created by God. It's one of those things I read, and, and I, I just sat back and thought, Whew, I'm just going to have to chew on that for a bit, because that just messed with my head. Because when we... It, I read that, and I think... If we say something is blessed, or it's a blessing, what we're saying is, is a fundamentally good thing. 
that is acting in line with God's will, with God's purposes, with God's desires. When, when someone shows up and we really needed someone to walk in that door and be there for us and with us, we say that's a blessing. And what we're saying is you are a child of God and you are doing exactly what God means to happen right now. And isn't that a blessing? Isn't that wonderful when that happens? When we say a meal is a blessing, what we're saying is this meal is a good meal and we're going to eat this meal in line with how God wants us, God's desire for how we are to eat. To eat as a family, to eat as one, to eat in celebration of what is good and at peace with each other. But to understand blessing like this, I, I, sat, I started thinking through all the passages of Scripture that, that use this word. For, for example, Abraham, at Genesis 12, Abraham is told, you are blessed. God tells him this. And you will, you will be the father of a great nation, and that will be a blessing to all the other nations. And so what's that mean? That means that, that Abraham's children will be a blessing that their purpose is to be good and then to call others to also be good and to follow God's will. And that's what, that's what we read, right? Israel is the vehicle through which God's will is known. They are the children of God to, to bring God's word to us. We, we read in uh, Jesus' most important sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, right? I have never preached on the Sermon on the Mount because I don't know how to begin. What's the first word of the Sermon on the Mount? Blessed. Up to just recently, I wouldn't have known what to do with that. I mean, you read this, this passage in Matthew 5. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who are persecuted. How do you call those folks blessed? What do you do with that? Well, you look at something like blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake and say, you know what? Sometimes we are persecuted for the sake of what is right and good. It might not be fun, but there are times when we, as people of God, we stand on what is good, and it is God's will that we stand on what is good. And if we get persecuted for it, that is a blessed moment. Not one I want to repeat often, but we could call that a blessing. And, and so this, just this one passage by this one German theologian has just messed with my head, and it's, it's beautiful. Because when we say something is blessed, what we are saying is, it is a good thing. And what is happening with it is in God's will. And we bless things to call them back to being in God's will. And so we go what to, to what Jesus says to us today. He says, you know, Thomas, I'm glad you believe. But all of those, y'all, who believe without having seen, they are blessed. You are blessed. What that means is that you are the children of God. You are good. And it is God's will for you, God's purpose, that you are here this day, believing without having seen. Even in the midst of all the doubts, of all the questions you might ask, this is God's purpose for you. This is God's calling to you, to believe without having seen. And so... I mean, and this doesn't go to lead to any sort of go forth and do anything crazy in the world. I don't have any big thing. Now go forth and do thus and such. I just want you to walk out of here knowing you are blessed. You are doing the exact thing God desires you to do. You are a child of God doing the most important thing you could possibly do in this moment. You are gathered in worship and there's nothing that is more important or better or more in God's will for you than right now. Thanks be to God. Amen.